two billion years. That's about how late we are in the galaxy. We are um, very late covers in the galaxy, according to models of line weaver. So that, uh, and this means that if there are other extraterrestrials out there, they have on average about two billion years advanced, technological advance compared to us. So what does this imply? You probably all know this complexity metric by uh, Eric Chesson, which is the energy rate density, the energy that flows uh, through a system of a given mass, and it has risen exponentially recently. And uh, so this means that if uh, it has risen two billion years earlier, this is not the correct picture of, the un of, uh, of uh, our universe of cosmic evolution, and this would be the correct picture, where the rise, we can uh, extrapolate, continues up to values that are much, much higher, so to 10 to 11, which is about the, the, the value of a nuclear bomb explo exploding. So here the, the strategy, the SETI strategy that I would like to propose is simply to follow the energy rate density because it's a, it's a robust metric to, uh, to, about com to measure complexity. We can just try to look at the universe and, and check what are the, the systems that have a high energy rate density and ask ourselves if this could be extraterrestrial uh, life or intelligence. So if you look at galaxies, they have a very low energy rate density, uh, 0 0.5. Uh, our sun has a value of about one. Planets such as the Earth has a value of 75. So that's still not very big. Um, so we might try to look in the universe for systems with higher energy. And of course, we think about supernovas that have values indeed 10 to the power of six, which is huge, but uh, uh, of course, we know that this destroys everything, the supernova, so it's not at all looking like a, a living system. Um, so what's the solution? Maybe um, we should look at uh, science fiction. Begin charging the weapon. Yes, sir. I've been charging. So this was uh, an extract from Star Wars, if you recognize it, and the new star killer base that sucks in energy for, from a star to, to gather its energy. Well, uh, of course that's Star Wars, so the physics is wrong here. Um, <laughs> but the idea comes from uh, systems that we know in, um, in astrophysics that are binary star systems in accretion and they have indeed huge values of uh, energy rate density, about 10 to the power of four. And uh, when I first computed this, I thought, this is abnormal, this is too high. This doesn't, shouldn't happen for a physical system. And so uh, this is what I want to, to present you today. It's the Stellivore hypothesis, which I define as uh, type two civilizations that actively feed on stars. And so, yeah, the big question is, how do we test if these things could be advanced extraterrestrials or not? So I'm not saying that all binary systems are, are alive, not at all. It's all really a tiny subset of binary star systems that are candidates. Basically, you have three kinds of uh, binary systems. The detached ones. So here on the left, you see the gravitational potential of the, of the two stars. And so the detached binaries, they, they don't interact with each other. So thermodynamically, they are basically dead. So they are like two stones and they don't do any work or so they are dead, so they are not good candidates. The other extreme is uh, binary star systems that are in a common envelope phase where the two stars are in contact and they will eventually merge and explode. So also this is not a good candidate for, uh, for, for life because it's like a wildfire that destroys everything. But there is a, the third category of binary star systems that are semi-detached, where you have uh, matter that is flowing from one star to another. And, um, and it's already interesting if you look at the gravitational potential, it's like uh, pouring water from one cup to another, 
you can already see that it's a, it's a kind of delicate balance thing to do. It's not obvious to maintain such a, such a state. So we can ask the question, could this be living things? So the literature on accreting uh, binary stars is uh, extremely complex. Um, most often they are classified by the mass of the companion stars, which can be either a low mass X-ray binary or a high mass one. Um, or they can be classified by the mass of the primary little astrophysical body that sucks in energy, which can be a white dwarf. And there are many kinds of white dwarfs. I'm not going to go into details here, but it's just to show you the, the diversity of, of these systems that we, we know. That are, so the white dwarf systems are called cataclysmic variables. You have also neutron star binar uh, in binary systems, and of course black holes. So instead of this, I want to, to, to show you some pictures so you can see uh, what they, they lo look like from illustrations. These are illustrations of real um, systems that we know. So these are white dwarf systems with uh, magnetic fields that channel the accretion flow. And here that uh, where the disk is, uh, is uh, deviated. Another magnetic white, white dwarf. Uh, magnetic white dwarf that has uh, what's called an accretion curtain, so it channels energy through a kind of curtain. And here it's a millisecond pulsar that has a, such a strong magnetic field that it diverts the accretion flow into, into a shock like this. And here is a microquasar, so a, a black hole sucking energy from, from a star. So what I want to use is uh, something that is very general, uh, which is living systems theory by James Greer Miller. And it's really a very powerful uh, framework to, to speak about extraterrestrial life because it's basically substrate independent. What it focuses on is are the, the, the functions of, of life. And basically he divided, um, he said that uh, living systems have 20 subsystems, components, which are here, uh, which manage either matter, energy, and information, so that, that's a reproducer function of, of, the living, of the living, either matter, energy, or information. And already it's interesting to notice that uh, traditional SETI is actually focused on one single subsystem, which is the output transducer, which is a bit uh, a weird name to, to say that uh, it's just uh, the information that goes out into in, in the environment. And so let's see um, how the steady worlds are with this, within this framework. So the first thing we can notice is that, uh, so to summarize, you have a, a dense body, which, is, which can be a white dwarf, a neutron star, a black hole. You have a companion star. And you have jets that, are, that expel matter out of the system, or novas in the case of uh, white dwarfs. And so in the study of our interpretation, the, the companion star is an energy source. The jets of nova are entropy production or waste production. And the dense body, that's a big question, maybe it's an advanced uh, civilization. So you might say, yes, but uh, okay, there is a flow of energy and there are things out, but is it controlled? Is it, is it really life also budgets information? If I was eating all the time or not eating at all, I would die. So we, we eat the right amount of food to, to maintain our organization. And indeed, uh, some binary star systems, such as this pulsar, is, are able to, to stop completely the accretion flow and then to start it again. And so they cycle between these states. So there, is, there seems to be a, an accretion flow control, which is hard to explain uh, from pure astrophysics, actually. Another uh, a way this, could, this uh, accretion control can happen is through the, um, the magnetic field of the primary, of the, here, of the white dwarf. So the white dwarf is here, and the companion star is here. So here the, the, um, the accretion rate is moderate because 
the magnetic field are, are not the strongest, so there is some matter going in. Here, by simply tilting the, the inclination of the white dwarf, the stronger part of the magnetic field goes to the companion star, and so the accretion flow, the accretion flow uh, increases. And here, if the inclination is totally uh, out, then the accretion stops. So that would be a, an example of a simple way to control the accretion flow. And indeed, we do observe uh, in our galaxy systems like this that have the magnetic field uh, tilted, which is not a stable um, situation from pure physics. It, it, it shouldn't stay like this. So this is a bit suspicious. So we already have fulfilled uh, free uh, living system sub, uh, criteria, the boundaries, so each a white dwarf and neutron star or black hole, they have boundaries. They have ingestor, they, they can ingest a matter from their environment, and they extrude, extrude waste products in terms of jets or nova, the jets that you saw. So we can ask now, do study rows store energy? Um, what has been observed is that, is a strange thing, is that as the accretion rate increases, so as the white dwarf neutron star or black hole takes in more matter, the number of ejections, the burst rate, actually decreases, which is strange if, if you think about it, because normally the more it would accrete, if it was a physical system, the, the more often it would, it would eject matter. That would seem logical. So this is pretty strange. And, um, uh, another feature of this system is that they have, they display double bursts, so they would eject uh, matter out, out uh, two times with a very short time interval of, of like five minutes. And uh, this time interval is uh, actually too short for, for burning the accretion fuel. So it's not simply what was accreted that is ejected I into the system. So this gives us another living subsystem, the matter energy storage, that uh, the systems are able to store matter and energy. But you might object, yes, but do they perform work? Is there, is there work going on? Uh, we don't know for sure, but what we do know uh, from observations is that the ejected material is not what, what ju was just accreted, which, which confirms uh, the, what I just said, uh, in the sense that uh, we observe heavier elements in the, in the novas or jets than the accreted material. So you might say the heavy elements are just created during the outburst, during the jet formation, but it's not uh, the case because it, would, it takes too much time to, to, to synthesize th those heavy elements, so it couldn't have been uh, synthesized then. So it means that we have some kind of conversion and production of uh, heavy of elements which add two more uh, subsystems. Another uh, characteristic of some binary systems is that they, they move through the galaxy. Here it's a binary black hole that, that goes like this and prop maybe into another galaxy. Um, so it seems that they have also the capacity to move. So the motor function in a Miller's living system framework and now you might object that uh, I've only spoken about matter energy exchanges, but you might say, well, but life is about, uh, is about information, information processing centrally. And there is an intriguing uh, feature of um, our galaxy is that if you look at some pulsars, the millisecond pulsars that are actually accelerated in binary systems that I, that I showed you. If you look at several of them, you can use them as a pulsar positioning system that is very similar to, in a very similar way as uh, GPS works. And the amazing thing is that this pulsar positioning system is accurate down to 100 meters on a galactic scale. So 100 meters. Uh, can you imagine this? So, um, what I propose is, uh, is to, to try to test if this pulsar positioning system could have been designed or arranged 
is to make an analogy with GPS. In GPS, you need to, to have the satellites carefully placed so that anywhere on Earth, you see at least three or four satellites so the, that you can uh, trilateralize your, your position, that you can make the, the computation. And, um, and so here is the distribution in the galaxy of uh, so, so, so Sidon of normal pulsars, so not the, the fast ones that are useful for navigation. So we see clearly that they are concentrated in the galactic disk. But it's uh, not the case with millisecond pulsars. They have a much more uniform distribution that you see here. Um, so it's not clear if it could be a, just a selection effect. It could be, but um, so more work is needed here. Even if the Stelivore hypothesis is totally wrong, this, has, uh, this pulsar positioning system has deep implications for, for SETI because it means that we have uh, a, a pulsar time standard in, in the galaxy that is very natural to use. And so all messages are likely to be timestamped in reference to this pulsar, uh, pulsar time standard. Also, the origin and destination of messages of artifacts are likely to have galactic coordinates that are encoded thanks to, to, to pulsars. And so, and the other advantage is that uh, those, those things of, uh, uh, such as time and location are metadata, so typically they are not encrypted. So it means it would be much e easier to, to decode uh, a trace of uh, metadata than it is to decode a, a real message from an extraterrestrial. So in total, um, I've shown you that there are Stelivores satisfy eight living systems, li living subsystems. Is it enough to prove that it's, it's life? Probably we need to work harder. Um, so if you want to know more, uh, I invite you to, to read chapter nine of my book, uh, this paper on uh, um, Acta in Acta Astronautica, and this other paper more recent about the pulsar posi positioning system in uh, the International Journal of Astrobiology. So probably I've stretched your mind a little bit too much, so I invite you to please stand up and also stretch your body, because I think we, we, ju we, we need it. Please. So if you, if you believe that the study of our hypothesis is true, you may sit down. <laughs> if not, please stay, stay up and, uh, and um, tell me your objections, refutation, and critiques, because that's how science can progress. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, the most fundamental objection to the whole idea. But uh, so basically what you're saying, it's uh, the God of the gap argument. That uh, simply is something we can't explain. Th therefore, it's God or it's the alien of the gap uh, actually here. Uh, how do we counteract this? With the scientific method. So actually, I have a backup slide here. Are we talking about astrophysics or astrobiology? So the, the issue is, uh, is, uh, is complicated because uh, we can describe everything in the universe in terms of physics, but that doesn't mean that, that things are, are dead. Like I can describe you in terms of math, height, velocity, but it doesn't mean you are dead. Uh, so 
it's the same with steady rows. It's, it's not because we can uh, describe uh, that there are astrophysical models of, of it, that it's necessarily just physical. And so to reply more specifically about your, the, the alien of the gap problem, there is no easy way out. I think we need to, to do two things, to take astrophysical models and to see how much we can explain and derive and take astrobiological or living models and see if we can explain more or new things. And gradually, there could be a shift towards the one or the other. But what I dislike is to a priori think that, that uh, astrobiology has no relevance at all. <laughs>